Welcome to another installment of The Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium. Today we're going to be talking about something stranger than fiction. Today we're going to be talking about how these goofy looking frogs, maybe adorable looking frogs, the African clawed frog, but not just the African clawed frog, all aquatic frogs have a magical ability. And that magical ability is something that humans have tried to figure out for years and years and years with varying degrees of some things help them to know and others didn't. But that thing is if a woman human is pregnant. So these frogs, yes, can let us know if a woman is pregnant. Now this is kind of a crazy story, kind of an interesting story, and... These frogs are known as African clawed frogs, these ones you're looking at right here. They are similar to the little African frogs that are African dwarf frogs. They're a dwarf version of this type of frog, essentially. But they live in Africa, Central and Southern Africa, and they spend most of their time underwater. They, these ones in particular, the clawed frog, not the dwarf frog, but the clawed frog actually can live a good five or six years and grow up to four to six inches in length. So it's a good sized frog and it's kind of interesting. So you might be asking yourself how in the heck did this frog end up being, and, and this is the, the craziest part, it ended, this was our only 100% accurate test that we used in the US from 1935 until 1962 this was it was using these frogs and doing something with female urine of pregnant women or those suspected to be pregnant so i'll get into that in a minute but uh let's let's go back a bit so there's this man and he has a pretty epic name his name is sir lancelot hogben and he was in africa doing trials using water buffalo glands, pituitary glands, and he would inject their glands into the pituitary glands, like the secretions, into the brain of pituitary glands of frogs. So it's a little teeny gland that's uh, way back in the brain and kind of near your, your core of your reptilian brain. But in frogs, I guess you can get to it with a syringe. So he's, in 1927... Through 1930, he is playing around with this, and he soon realizes that women, through correspondence with other people, that women are secreting uh, hormones that are produced in their pituitary gland, or at least a signal of those hormones is produced in the pituitary gland during pregnancy. So the pituitary gland is also uh, responsible for causing you to grow when you're young and going through puberty. So it makes sense that it's involved in making new humans also. Now, he had ongoing debates with other South African teams that were studying this frog, and he happened to be down in the heart of South Africa, down in Johannesburg, and he also spent a little bit of time in Cape Town, and he went up into Zimbabwe, uh, which used to be formally known as, uh, well, several of these places were formally known as different things, but uh, he spent time, at, at the time it was, Z there was Zaire that he was spending time in, also uh, up in T Tanzania, Kenya. So he was in a lot of different countries where they were finding these frogs and then bringing them back to South Africa as his main, say, uh, location. So he turns, it turns out he injects frogs, with pregnant ox galls, they're killing the, the ox glands, they're killing the ox, obviously, they're taking the gland out of its brain, but he's taking pregnant ox, and he's injecting that into the pituitary gland of frogs. I don't know why you'd go out on a limb and just, like, randomly decide to do that, but apparently something in the science community informed him he should do such a thing. So, he did that, he saw that the frogs, even when separated from males, would lay eggs. And there were also old tribal myths in some of the cultures in these regions in Africa, specifically over in Namibia, some of the desert cultures with the, you gotta, you gotta do the click, Kong San, Kung San is how it looks like it's spelled, the Kung San people. Uh, 
would use these frogs by urinating on them. They also, interestingly enough, different versions of these frogs, um, other uh, desert toads, they would use as water sources. So frogs have a big sacred position in some of these African cultures because they both represent fertility and when the rain's falling and a lot of them can go dormant and bury themselves under the mud. Very interesting creatures for uh, a lot of these cultures and to us today too. So he starts doing testing then with human urine. And the reason he wants to do this is because there were already tests. So here's some interesting pictures and they're testing with frogs. And the reason he wants to figure this out is because, here's another picture of the frog up close, by the way. Thought I'd give you the, the cuter, out of water, uh, normal looking frog. You can see its claws, though, or its supposed claws. Here is uh, Lancelot Hogben. Just want to say that name one more time, maybe five more times, who knows. Um, but yeah, so here's a little slide. Until the 1960s, the only reliable pregnancy test was to inject a woman's urine into a female African clawed frog. If the woman was pregnant, the frog would ovulate within 12 hours. So you may ask, so this is the book he, he published, but you may ask, well, why, were there any other methods? Yes, there were. Actually, there was one other method which was not very popular in the U.S. because of, one, there was some animal rights uh, response to it, but also, two, it was more expensive, and three, it took more time. So the other method, I don't want to go too in-depth because I don't want to get graphic to people, but you would take the urine of a female, you would inject that into the ovaries of a rabbit, and this test was developed in 1927, publicized in 1929, so this is all really close to the same time. And some people use the rabbit test, it was based in Germany, and so France, Germany, Switzerland, even the UK... Uh, the rabbit test was a little more popular, and a few people did it in the U.S., but not in mass. So they start doing the rabbit test in some metropolitan cities like New York and uh, Baltimore, London, Paris, Munich. And they're doing this test where they inject the rabbit with, with human urine, and they wait a while, and then they have to cut open and kill the rabbit, and they look at the rabbit's ovaries, and if they have swollen, then they know that the woman is pregnant because that swelling was caused by her hormones, the, the ones associated with pregnancy. So this guy comes along, Lancelot Hogben, comes along with his frog studies in South, uh, South, <laughs> South Africa. I was going to say America, sorry. So South Africa, he comes along and he says, yeah, I think we can do it differently. And so he'd used his ox gall experiments, which basically I think he was trying to figure out testosterone and hormones in oxen, if you could use that in humans. And then he switched gears when he found out that the rabbit thing was going on. And so here's more examples of, of his frogs. These are old publication photos, actually. But they start uh, cultivating them in mass, and he had a lot of women technicians who helped him, and oftentimes in labs and things, it was uh, women as nurses and things who were growing these frogs. So they would take the frogs, they would inject them with the urine, and within 12 to 24 at the most hours, they would lay eggs without being around males. Now the great thing about this is it doesn't kill the frog. You can do it a bunch of times, and the frog lives five or six years. So you could do it like you could rotate every couple of days and have this happen as long as you were giving the pr frog proper nutrients. So one, this really helps out uh, our understanding of amphibians because they had to figure out how to keep these alive. And this whole frog test sounds a lot better than the rabbit test because the rabbit test is a little gruesome. You know, people like rabbits. Let's just go with that. Uh, and it's a little gruesome to keep rabbits still all day waiting to be injected with urine and, and killed. So he came up with this test. Uh, they also tried uh, with mice and other animals, but nothing works as well as amphibians. And so all the amphibians that you have that are waterborne, that's also why you've heard in other cases, uh, you know, of 
uh, estrogen, estrogenic chemicals, uh, esterones, which are what are picked up in in pregnant women and also in uh, birth control and various other medications and things. We have found frogs that are, you know, 70% female in ponds and things where they're close to a big city where a lot of people are taking birth control and it gets flushed down the sewer. At least that was the, the prediction. Now, I'll probably have another episode where I go into that, but really quickly, they just recently did a study out of Harvard and out of Cambridge. Uh, they worked together. And two papers were written, and then another one was written about ponds in Connecticut. And they were outside of the city by far, but they were lit around clover and soy and peanut growth. And uh, this this um, chemical, uh, bisphenol A, is an endocrine disruptor, and it is produced by those crops. And it turns out that those ponds that they thought all the frogs were flipping because of birth control and things like that, there's still Prozac and other things that are it building up and bioaccumulating in, in frogs and animals. But frogs are very frequently the first animal to find out something's wrong in the environment because they have a skin that, that kind of lives and breathes the water that they, I mean, no, it doesn't breathe them, but I mean, it, it soaks in every part of the water. It gets nutrients and it's this kind of porous, uh, soft tissue membrane almost, um, as well as some frogs, especially aquatic frogs, stay underwater for a really long time, and so it's, it, you know, it soaks into them, but it turns out that those plants were creating that. As of 2015, uh, they were finding that plants were doing that, and there's this famous book written by uh, Theo Colburn called Our Stolen Future that was talking about medications in our water, and it uses frogs with birth de defects and crazy rates of, you know, all female frogs and no male frogs left, but it turns out that uh, it may not have been from humans, that may have played a small part, but they're finding from massive amounts that clover, uh, all legumes, so soy, peanuts, things like that, are actually putting out the chemical in massive amounts the way they are used uh, in agricultural farming and running into the streams. So that's a side note of how useful these frogs are to tell you things about their environment. Now, as they got better, they brought methods of these taking care of these frogs back into the United States, all across the world, and Oftentimes, as I said, women were the ones doing these tests. There's, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of pictures, if you Google it, that are almost always women. So that's just kind of another interesting uh, aspect of it that, um, you know, they're the ones doing the lab work and being the nurses at the time and in a time when, before civil rights had really uh, kicked in and women had just recently got the vote, um, this was a job that uh, involved predominantly women. So... So it's of note. I don't know what to make of it necessarily. I'll let you decide. But it's a job in the sciences that involves women. And they are taking samples here, and they will inject the samples into the frogs that are in the bins behind them. And they'll put the frog in isolation, and they will see if it lays eggs. If it does, the woman is pregnant. And that's that's all there is to it. And then they let the frog heal up. Basically, the limit of how fast they can use one frog is based on um, how much energy it takes to lay an egg. So if, if it has enough energy to lay more eggs, then go for it. So here's more books just talking about that. I just wanted to throw that in there. Also, you can see the like look of shame of the, the women in the pictures. I had to blank some stuff out because YouTube will uh, not like it. But those are old medical books. So other than that, I wanted to talk about something kind of interesting, which is, so in the South, these frogs were very, very popular. They were popular other places. In the South, they were popular uh, also because there was a very strong stigma against having a child out of wedlock, and you wanted to know very quickly whether you had a kid so you didn't have to get an abortion. Abortions were illegal across the country, and these were areas where people wanted to find out that. Beyond that, there are also warm areas where the frog can live. So there's some pockets in California, things like that. But this specific map is where those frogs now have escaped the lab 
<clears throat> and can be found still to this day. But for a while, there were issues with it all up the East Coast. And in the summers, it was frequent to find frogs because sometimes they just throw out the eggs, which weren't fertilized. Um, but they'd get them mixed up if the males and females were in the breeding pen. Sometimes they'd just throw out those eggs so they didn't have to deal with tadpoles. So kind of bizarre, but they end up out in the water. And around the 1960s, 1961 to 63, they start to figure out that these frogs are not the only thing they can use. And they end up using uh, a test. Finally, just a test that's a chemical test that looks for a certain chemical. And so by 1963, the testing of all of these frogs, having these frogs literally at your doctor's office, it, they didn't mail things quite as much back then because it wasn't as quick. They had all these frogs at your local clinic if you lived in a city uh, and or you'd drive to the city. And after 30, 35 years of using these frogs, they had a test that they developed that found... Uh, HCG, I believe, is the chemical that they were looking for at the time. But of note, in the 19, late 1920s and the early 1930s, there became an expression, as I mentioned, rabbits were used first. So even with these frogs, uh, it was said either jokingly in a sarcastic way or really in a, in a sad way that the rabbit died. And that meant that you were pregnant. So it was kind of, it was kind of, uh, I guess, it was a saying for a while. So if somebody got pregnant, especially out of wedlock or young or something like that, they would say, ah, the rabbit died, you know. And that was a originally a German saying, but it made its way around the world. And the average clinic back then was killing up to 6,000 rabbits, like the average uh, in Berlin in... Paris. So this was a popular service, and these frogs really stopped that. So, kind of interesting, experimenting on one animal helped another one. But the last thing I wanted to talk about was these frogs have an enduring legacy, which is one, being kept as a pet, and two, it was the first animal to be successfully cloned and be viable. So, that's kind of interesting. Something in the biology makes it that way. Uh, I wanted to end this on a frog happy family. Now they're not getting stuck with urine anymore. And uh, they are living happily in many aquariums around the world. So that is the story of the African clawed frog and women's pregnancy. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little story. It's an odd tidbit. It kind of ties into your aquarium. You could do it to a African dwarf frog if you can hit that pituitary gland. It's much harder to hit on the smaller African dwarf frogs, um, but, you know, it, it ends up being possible. So uh, I forgot to mention that Lancelot Hogben uh, is made somewhat of a famous man after this. He is given many commendations, and he leaves South Africa and he writes heavily about the racism that's going on in South Africa. Now, this is probably true that he cares about racism, but also he hated the South African team that was working on the same tests, and there's still debates who was doing the test first. Regardless of all that, interesting character, awesome name, and he discovered an amazing amount of amphibians, fish, and other things uh, in Africa in his explorations and tried all sorts of wild kind of mad scientist stuff. So hope you enjoyed that. Hope you enjoyed these frogs and this happy family. And I will talk to you next time here on The Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share it if it's interesting. And uh, lastly, when you subscribe, click that little bell next to the subscribe button if you want to catch more of me and the channel and the happy frogs. So, all right, guys, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one and swim on.